Herzlich willkommen. A warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the honored panelists. I am Hannes Britschke, and I am the editor-in-chief of the Sonntagsblick. The organizers have asked me to moderate in German, and I'm going to do that gladly. All the panelists can enjoy good translations, so we shouldn't have any problems. Today's topic is climate justice, basis of a new global solidarity. As a moderator, I usually say that we really have an excellent uh, membership on the panel. This is what I usually say, but I think tonight is really true. Let me first start with Kofi Annan on my right with the introductions. He's, of course, known as former Secretary General from 1997 to 2006. In 2001, he was given the Nobel Prize for Priests, and he started his career as a diplomat of his country. He's also the chairman of the Humanitarian Forum of Global Humanitarian Forum. Then I would like to introduce to you the president of Guyana, Barrett Jagdera. He's always been one of the young global leaders of the WEF, so a warm welcome to you as well. Then Raj Singh. He is the chief risk officer of the Swiss Re, the Swiss reinsurance company. You know that this is the world leading reinsurance company. And just on the side, let me also say that the company started its operations in 1863 with a big fire in the canton of Glarus. Then Ajit Galupchand, who is chairman and managing director of the Hindustan Construction Company in India. And I'm very pleased also to introduce you Howard B. Dean III, who is or used to be the leader of the Democrats in the United States. He was also part of the presidential campaign. And I'm sure that he's very pleased now to see the new president in the White House. So a warm welcome to you as well. Anyway, a big round of applause to all the panelists this evening. Das Open Forum Davos. The Open Forum Davos 2009 is organized jointly by the WEF and the Swiss Federation of Protestant Churches. The subject climate justice is also being co-organized by the Global Humanitarian Forum. That is why we have chosen this subject, this very important subject. More than three quarters of the CO2 emission responsible for the climate uh, climate uh, change is caused by the most industrialized countries, and only 49% of the remaining countries are responsible for the one remaining percent of the emission. So it is the poorest of the world that obviously are suffering most from the climate change caused by CO2 emissions. So let's begin the discussion. We have about one hour during which the panelists will be discussing, and then there will be more opportunity than it, more than enough opportunity for you in the public to put questions during the remaining half hour. So please take part actively, and we look forward to an interesting debate. Kofi Annan, may I start with you, and also with the title of this subject tonight, Climate Justice. What does that really mean? Why are we talking about climate justice? Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight, and I'm particularly pleased to see so many young people who are here following what we're going to do about climate change and our planet. After all, it's you who are going to inherit the planet, and you have to really stay engaged and make sure that my generation hands it over in a good state. And uh, as 
keep the pressure on on me, on leaders, on politicians, and make sure that we honor the promise to keep the planet safe for future generations. And I often remind people of the African proverb which says, uh, the planet is not ours, it's a treasure we hold in trust for future generations. So your presence here and your engagement is extremely important. As the chairman said, we, we live in a world where a small number of countries are doing most of the pollution. Most of the, over three quarters of the pollution comes from the EU, the United States, China, Russia, India, and Japan. And yet, the poor are bearing the blunt. About the 50 poorest countries who are less than 1% responsible for less than 1% of the uh, pollution are bearing the brunt. Bearing the brunt in the sense that those who live in small island states are seeing sea levels threaten their very habitat. To the extent that one of them, the Prime Minister of Maldives, has announced that he's looking around to buy a new country for his people because he's worried that their home, their island, we be washed away. In fact, I went to Maldives after the tsunami. This is a country of islands, many islands, where the highest point was 1.8 meters. So you could imagine with waves and what happened to this, and quite a lot of them were washed away. The main island survived because they had taken protective measure and built a wall around it. In, in a, and obviously this is patently not just. We need to find ways of uh, assisting the poor. I know many people believe that climate change is something waiting to happen, but it is happening today, as I have indicated. It's having real impact on lives of individuals and communities. Lest you think it's only the poor who are going to suffer uh, from the climate change, we are all at risk. We are all at risk from extreme weathers. We are all at risk from uh, uh, extreme weather patterns, hurricanes, storms. And 50% of the world's population live in coastal areas. And coastal cities, if we keep the climate up the way we are, with the ice caps melting, would also be flooded. And what happens to the people who live in these uh, areas? For the poor in the poorer countries, land that their parents used to farm are now deserts. They can't use them anymore. So we need to find a way of helping. And what I think would be fair and just is to get all of us to accept the premise, the concept, that we need to act on pollution first. Second, pollution has a cost. And if pollution has a cost, who should pay for it? It should be the polluter. We should charge the polluter for uh, pollution and use some of the resources to help the poor adapt, either in the, by uh, building dikes or whatever they need to do. But what, what is important when we talk of climate development and adaptation, we are really talking about sustainability. Whatever we do must be sustainable. The development and the actions we take must be sustainable. Not far from here, we have Netherlands, a country that has learned over decades to live underwater and has adapted very effectively. So adaptation is possible and it can uh, be done. Even in individual countries here in Switzerland, why should the person who takes a tram car or bicycles or walks subsidize a neighbor who is determined to use his SUV when even Americans are giving it up? We have to have a system that brings in some equity. And I'm convinced that if we come together as people, as a movement, and insist that climate change must be dealt with, that we need a robust agreement in Copenhagen, and that agreement must be based on equitable, must have an equitable basis, must be fair, and therefore 
we move ahead along those lines, I think we are likely to succeed. That is, the, in simple terms, the explanation for the climate justice, that the polluter pays and we use it to help the poor and make our world safer. So we will launch it in June in Geneva, and it is not a, a movement for me or the Alliance, it's a movement for you for you to tell your leaders what you want, for you to tell the world enough is enough and you are not going to accept pollution anymore, and to tell them that we are going to remain engaged, we are going to monitor them, and we'll be keeping an eye on them in Copenhagen. And they have to come out of Copenhagen with a robust, enforceable, healthy agreement and this is what the peoples of the world want. So join the movement and let's maintain the pressure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kofi Annan. President Jack Dale, Kofi Annan has said very clearly that the environmental problems and environmental policies also have a social side. How do you see it from your point of view? How do you see these two tasks? Well, thank you very much. Um, I too, like the distinguished Secretary General, I'm very pleased to be here. And I share his views that it's so encouraging to see so many young people here. I recall the campaign to wipe, wipe off third world debt. And the only time it got traction, the only time it got on the agenda of the G7 was when ordinary people got involved, particularly the churches. I remember a campaign that started in the UK by the church people called Jubilee 2000, and that made a great difference to debt relief for the developing world at the bilateral level and at the multilateral level. I think gatherings such as the, this one that we have here today can lend impetus to us having an agreement, a balanced agreement in Copenhagen that looks to the needs of the developed world as well as the developing world. Those countries that have faced the brunt of the impact of climate change um, and who have contributed so little to climate change. Sometimes it's not understand the magnitude of resources that would take for these countries to adapt to climate change. Take, for example, the whole Kyoto Protocol has $400 million for adaptation. I have worked with McKinsey and Company in my country because we live, we're a country the size of United Kingdom, but most of us live on a narrow coastal belt which is below sea level. Um, if we have to strengthen the sea defenses and the conservancy dam in just two of the ten regions in my country to adopt the climate change, it will cost $450 million. And the Kyoto Protocol has $400 million for the adaptation in the whole world. So clearly, we need to scale up the resources. We have had catastrophic flooding, and I've seen the changes. We used to have, on average, seven inches of rainfall in one month. Now I get 10 inches in one night. What accumulates large numbers of people there. And this story can be replicated and told right across the developing world and the consequences that you spoke about for people and their livelihoods. And these countries have very little resources to meet those funds. Many of them still run budget deficits, still have the challenge of meeting education and health needs because they're unmet. Um, they still have the challenge of creating jobs for their people. And then they simply don't have resources to divert to address the issue of adaptation for climate change. I feel it's, it's a question of perspective and one of will. Take, for example, we've all seen the recent global financial crisis. We feel the consequences of this crisis. By the end of it, the world would spend some $8 trillion on dealing with this crisis. 
all that is needed to, to avoid climate change is a fraction of that sum. The arguments that they use in spending this money is that they are institutions that are too big to fail. So you have to inject cash in them, either government taking equity in these institutions or guaranteeing their loans. So if the institutions are too big to fail and it will cause catastrophe, just think how worse if the world were to fail. And the world will fail if we practice business as usual. If we don't limit CO2 equivalent to 450 parts per million by 2050, you'd have temperature rises above two, le two degrees Celsius. That would spell catastrophe, not only for the developing world, for the whole world. You're going to have catastrophic changes. So what we're talking about is saving the world here. There, we spend $8 billion to save institutions because of the systemic impact, and we lose sight of the bigger challenge. This money could be found. We spent close to 7 you would spend 7% of GDP, global GDP, if the price of oil is $150 per barrel. If it's $60 a barrel, you spend 2.7% of global GDP. And all that will, is needed for climate change to address it, both from a capital expenditure side and financing flows, is less than 1% of GDP, less than what we spend in buying oil in a, in a single year. So I think we have to understand the arguments. We have ordinary people have to press their leaders to make the commitments. Europe has said that it will cut greenhouse gases by 25, maybe 20 to 30 percent by, by 2020. Is that enough? Even if the United States of America, and we're very pleased that with the enlightened policies now that the new administration has had, but they said they will get by 2020, they will get to 1990 level, get down to 1990 level. That will only deliver nine gigatons of carbon CO2 reduction. What we need by 2020 is 17 gigatons. So the countries, Europe and the rest of the world are not making the commitments now that are needed to avoid catastrophe. You have to press your leaders to do this. Um, there are low-cost abatement solutions. European businesses already pay 25 to 30 dollars per ton of carbon dioxide in the EU ETS. In, in forestry, we did a study, and it would cost, if you preserve the world's forests, it will cost $4 per ton of carbon. There is a low-cost abatement solution. And the, the preservation of forests, which contribute, the destruction of forests contribute close to 20% of GDP, 20% um, of global emissions, that could be reduced. So I think that this, this requires commitment, will, on the part of the industrial world. And the resources can be found if there is a commitment to the issue. And there, is, there is, has to be some justice about it. They can't expect a country like mine where the per capita emission level is one thirtieth of that of the United States of America to contribute equally to the problem. And somehow, in the development, in the debates in, in Europe and in the developed world, they seem to think that we must all contribute equally to the problem. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Howard Dean, I, let's assume that it's not so easy to be here as the representative of the United States and take part in such discussions, knowing that for years your country has not signed the Kyoto Protocol. America, America the biggest polluter per capita worldwide, and you have now heard the request, the claims, we need know-how, we need the means. So what does it mean for you and justice and equity in this area? 
Well, I don't speak for President Obama, but I'm certainly going to speak on his behalf in the sense that I, we obviously have a very different approach, uh, and you've seen it already. Uh, the past administration uh, did almost everything they could to stop any progress whatsoever. Uh, this administration has already said that individual states such as California may limit automobile emissions. That's very important. I, when I was governor, I was uh, one of the a governor of a state that followed California and did all the things that California d did. And so now we're able to do that again. So there's already some concrete evidence that America will be in a very different position than we have been for the last eight years. Um, let me just make a couple of points because I think the Secretary General and the President have already said, laid out the case very clearly. So I'll say a few things. First, um, with great respect for Secretary General and Nobel Laureate Kofi Annan, I think someone needs to make the moral case, but I don't think the moral case is going to move the world. I think that you have to make also an economic case. And the economic case is very clear. Human beings are not so good at thinking long term. And we often find short term excuses to do things that we, if we don't do long term, we're going to suffer greatly. Um, uh, uh, this financial crisis that we're in, uh, it, partly it's bad leadership in the banks, especially in the United States, although European banks weren't happy to take this stuff too. But a lot of it is the behavior of consumers, particularly in America, who lived off savings and, ha uh, excuse me, there were no such thing as savings in America, uh, <laughs> who lived off the equity in their house for many, many years. So if you live, if you spend more than you make for many, many years, eventually you have to pay the bill, and now we have to pay the bill. Well, the same thing will happen in global warming, but the bill is, bill is much more serious. Instead of uh, some very difficult financial times, the bill is your life and your country, and in some cases, the whole country. So this is a, not only just a moral problem, it's an economic problem. And I think the president uh, was particularly uh, correct when he said we have to put an economic long-term price and incorporate that into whatever we do with global, uh, on climate change and global warming first. Secondly, uh, let me say I have great hopes for Copenhagen. Uh, and I completely agree with the president of Guyana because I believe that we cannot reasonably – there are three – or I guess there are three countries or four countries represented up here, a European country, and there's no question that the Europeans are leading uh, the way in this issue. Uh, uh, India, a very fast developing country. Guyana, a, uh, a poor country, but one that is also would like to do some developing. And then the United States. Uh, probably as, as uh, the moderator so delicately put it, the biggest villain uh, in this story. So let me agree with the president. Everybody has to contribute, but not everybody has to contribute equally. And we should make Kyoto and Copenhagen uh, successful by insisting that the BRIC countries, uh, uh, also Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China contribute something, which they were not required to do in, the la in Kyoto, but that the United States and Europe should contribute more. Because it is true that India, and China, India by the time we get there, and China already is actually uh, polluters on the scale of the United States, but we have the largest per capita ability to lower our pollution levels because we pollute more than anybody else. The Europeans have recognized that. Under the old administration in the United States, we refuse to recognize it. Now I think you will see a recognition of this. But everybody must be included. There is no country that should be exempt from doing something. And that is a very important part of moving uh, this forward. Uh, secondly, um, and I, oh, I rarely disagree with what the Europeans are doing because they're, the Europeans in general are far more progressive than, than American, um, America is as a country. But I think I am skeptical about uh, carbon, uh, attack, uh, carbon uh, offsets. I, I see the day someday when Bernie Madoff or his successor will get a hold of carbon offsets and collect a lot of money for something that doesn't exist. And when that happens, the entire – if we put all our eggs in carbon offsets and, and, and trade in cap, when that happens, the entire thing will be discredited. I'm not, I don't advocate that we not use carbon uh, uh, offsets uh, and trade in cap, but I think a carbon tax is inescapable. It is a very tough thing to do politically, but it's going to have to happen. It may not be so great for a developer 
developing nation, so maybe we should make, have different systems in different countries. We should be as flexible as we can, but we have to get there. And I think some sort of a carbon tax. In the United States, we all know uh, what happened to Al Gore's campaign when he wanted a carbon tax. He got in some trouble for that. So we can use it to offset payroll taxes. You raise the carbon tax, you use it to offset uh, Social Security and Medicare and so forth. There's ways you can make it tax neutral, but the outcome of what you do makes a big difference. And there has to be an economic price which corresponds to the real price of what we produce. Finally, uh, let me be a politician and pander again to our audience. I believe as a result of the American economic weakness and as a result of the financial catastrophe that the United States started, that a huge shift has taken place. The influence in, uh, among uh, the world financial community from Russia and from the United States has gone down. Us, because we began serious problems and our financial system is in more trouble than most of yours. Russia, because they have backslid from the rule of law, which is, and of course oil has gone from $150 to $150, to $50. Uh, and we have less influence now. I believe that the key regulations that are going to be adopted by the world in areas such as the environment, labor, uh, finance are going to be European regulations. Ultimately, there's going to be an enormous commercial push towards unifying world regulations. In the past, that would have been done by the United States, and other countries would have adopted those regulations. Now, when China has to get some serious food safety regulations, I think they're going to look at the Europeans before they look at the United States, because the relative clout of these, country, of these regions, these markets, has changed dramatically. So that's good news for climate change, because I think, again, the Europeans have been the most responsible countries, certainly not perfect, as the Secretary General has suggested, but the most, most progressive uh, set of countries uh, in the world on this issue. We all need to push ourselves further, including the Europeans, but the good news is you are probably in the driver's seat, and on this issue, I think that's a very good thing. Archit Gulajan, the BRIC countries have not yet been obliged to assume any responsibility under the Kyoto Protocol. That was the application of the principle of justice. But Howard Dean has just said that uh, in Copenhagen this will no longer run. Also, the emerging countries, the threshold countries, including China, will have to make their contribution. What is your stand on that? How do you see that the contribution of the emerging countries and the threshold countries? This is going to be decided in Copenhagen at the meeting in December this year. Well, I have one privilege that I do not have to speak for any government. <laughs> I speak as an Indian citizen and a corporate citizen as well that is concerned and would like to do some, everything that is possible about climate change. Well, this year what we are seeing is uh, one of the, the good things that has come out of a serious financial crisis and an economic downturn is that there will be less production and there's going to be a little less pollution during the whole year. <laughs> It will be short-lived, but it has done its little bit of good to the environment. The second good news, which is a little more long-term and far more important, is that America is back and backing environmental improvements and backing the policy of, of recognizing climate change, and I think that is a great news. The question that has been posed to me, and it's rightly so, that that when we look at the developed and the developing world or the industrial world and the one that is industrializing, we must recognize the aspirations of the people that have not yet been in a developed country. The ultimate aim of these countries is to finally, its peoples must live like the way the developed countries' peoples live. And television has delivered the story more than anybody else to them. Look at how the better half of the world lives. And we want to live like that. Now this, whilst it, it is a wonderful aspiration, does mean that it is going to lead to more pollution. And this pollution that it is going to lead to needs to be addressed in the interest of those countries as well. 
However, the debate so far has been excessively putting the blame where it should be. Who should be blamed for causing this pollution just because money now has to be spent to clean up the, clean up the world's environment? Even if that be so, I think we should move on from that debate as to who's caused it, but move on to the idea of saying, how are we going to get rid of it, and how are we going to share this? There are different, even in the case of developing countries, the countries like India and China, which are progressing at a very rapid rate, and therefore joining the ranks of the big polluters very fast. Not on a per capita basis, but certainly on a total basis. As there are other countries that have still remained behind, have to still come into the full developing, of the process of being a developing country. And they too, if you scratch anybody down there, however poor he is or she is, her aspiration is to finally live in a home that, that is even a simple American lives, grand homes. So with this in question, we need to look at how are we going to achieve this. And for this, while debates and discussions have taken place, what I find is that there has not been sufficient awareness created in those countries. We, for example, most of our companies want to look at pollution, want environmental controls. In fact, today now, when this movement began of green buildings, we, are, we were discussing just about eight, ten years ago, we now have a billion square feet of buildings that are green. So this movement is catching with, with the industrialized part of the country. However, there's a large population that is still not convinced because their concerns are getting rid of poverty. Poverty itself is a great polluter. Because of that, our forests are being denuded on one side. Our forests are also bringing firewood, which is causing further pollution. The slums in which most people live in are such hell that just getting out of them is a bigger priority. So aligning the, the priorities of the poor, of coming out of their poverty on one side, of the middle classes that would like to see the prosperity of the West in their lives, aligning those to the needs of climate change, I think is going to be the biggest political task that politicians in those countries, and I would urge politicians around the world, from the Western countries who, are, who would like to have the cooperation of the developing world, must also take the pains to go out and campaign for. So in this context, because there are some anomalies here, for example, you have Norway, which is, which is one of the cleanest countries, least pollutants. But the fact is they're using hydro power for their electricity, but, but they, they ship the oil out to other countries. And so the pollution is happening somewhere else as a result of which, which Norway is getting richer. It is not to say that they shouldn't do it, but when we look at the standards, we need to know who is the originator. For example, British Airways causes one of the biggest pollutions in the world because of the amount of fuel, the, the large fleet of British Airways and their, their wonderful connections around the world cause. But is British Airways causing the pollution or is it the people, the, the big uh, NGOs, the green NGOs that are traveling on those planes also causing the pollution? To I come to these, discussions like today. <laughs> to come to discussions like today. So I think these are very complex questions. People in countries like ours cannot understand. They are, some of them are not even concerned with them. Others are finding it unfair. And therefore it is finally boiling down to uh, the, the equitable right to pollute. And this equitable right to pollute is now creating this, uh, this kind of problem. So I think we need to get beyond it. All countries, we can't just go on demanding from the West that they should pay. It is also important that those countries, don't they care about their own children? And I think we need to look at it as a composite problem. Yes, equitable share. There's also just one more thing I want to say. If you are going to beat this, the very fact that the present levels of technology are continuing to create this pollution, it is necessary for us to understand the changes in technology, the improvements, the innovation that we are going to require to really beat this is going to be quite enormous. 
And therefore it will have to be an innovation that will have to be chased by every bright individual around the world. And for this we will have to find money. So anybody who is going to find this innovation would look forward to making some money out of it. And if there is no money in it, he's not going to make that innovation. So how are we going to send, say, don't take, make this innovation and then distribute it free to the rest of the world? It's not likely to happen. We've got to find out another mechanism of some kind of a common fund that can be created so that the developers and the innovators are not penalized and we get the development and innovation that we require to clean up the world. Well, here are some of the complex issues. I'm not able to put down a positive direction we should take, but I've placed some of the issues that confront Copenhagen. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Raj Singh. For C Mr. Raj Singh. You are doing business with climate, with the climate uh, matter. We've heard a lot about environmental issues, social issues, and the third aspect is now the economic side of the whole matter. So my question to you is, how do we move from the ethics, the morals, to the economic dimension. How do we find an economic response to this global issue uh, without having to accuse one another of not being morally correct? How can we set up a system where we can find some social and economic responses to the issues? No, in, in terms of Swiss Re, we have a long obligation, long-standing obligation to climate change because climate change is a core part of our business. Even today, we insure things that are near the water, on the water. So even in that aspect, we're already driving certain behaviors. But I think the key factor that many people have kind of pointed to is the economics. Ultimately, the economics will matter. And economics already matters. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. If you look at the kind of insurance payouts we used to do for storms, it was from the 1970 to the roughly 1990 period, it averaged about $5 billion annually. In 2000, but now it's gone up since in the, in the 90s, it's more like $27 billion per year. And this is just insured losses. That doesn't mean uninsured losses. So this is just insured losses paid for in the advanced world. Now, if you look at 2005, when we had these large U.S. storms, we paid out in excess of 100 billion as an industry. So the economics is already real, but what, what bringing the economics in does, it brings in automatically ad mitigation, adaptation, it's forced into the system. What, is, what, what do I mean by that? So if we are insuring something that's near the water, we help define biz, b building codes. We get stronger building codes, stronger other elements. So that's one way the economics is already there. But bringing it to the more emotive side, we're working very hard with the very poor countries. Because when I talk to you about floods in Germany, if you remember, most of you remember the floods in Germany in 2004, the event cost roughly 40 billion. Now, it cost, it cost the German government, in total, total loss was around 40. At the end of the day, insured losses were only 9 billion. The rest was picked up by the German government. Now see, for a country like Germany that's economically fairly well off, they can tax the people, they can get the money back, it's not so much of a problem. If you just uplift the same thing and put that into a smaller developing country and you have a large single event, it creates havoc for their treasury. Even to get the aid there in time is not easy. So we are working very hard with people, with multilateral banks, with people like the World Bank, with the IMF, in bringing out the discussion of how should they bring the strategy of country risk evaluation, true disaster evaluation, into their normal processes when they're reviewing poor countries. But the, the idea is to at least drive the thought, because also in poor countries, in all of them, it's not very easy to drive the idea of either any kind of insurance type thinking 
or mitigation or adaptation when people think, well, a big storm, if it doesn't happen in my term, better, why should I pay the money up front or do anything about it? I have lots of other problems to worry about, so please go away. So I think we're driving this discussion, and what's interesting is the discussion is rather successful, and we are having small successes, and I would like to state a few, because the emotive side has already brought 300 people in this room, which is about 300, 400, I could not tell. That's very positive, but we have to make the economics start to work. So what we have done is, for example, and I won't go into the real details of the transactions, but we're working with the Caribbean countries together with the Inter-American Development Bank. So we have set up a kind of a hurricane facility, insurance facility, where they are insuring with common other insurance companies. We provide the insurance coverage for them. But basically when a certain storm hits, they don't have to look around for aid agencies or other people to get money. The cash is there immediately. And we're doing this with what we call parametric triggers. So it's not a big thing, well, how did the house burn down? Let's evaluate it. It's very, very, um, very easy to tell. It'll be by wind speed or other kind of elements which are very independent to pay out things. So we've done a very large facility with the CARICOM countries right now, which has been set up in conjunction. That's one example. But I'd like to give one or two others which are very important. In India, we started with a very small program to start to insure farmers from, from extreme weather. That started with roughly, I think, covering 4,000 farmers. Today we're covering 350,000 farmers in a region from extreme weather. And if the extreme weather occurs, the worst thing they can have happen is, is first thing, they lose their crop. The second thing is they have to buy new seed, so they're completely with no money to do anything. So that kind of a facility pays out immediately for them. But the very nice thing about these, these are all small examples, but these small examples are being worked at with public-private partnerships, little money from the governments at times. We are doing this at very, very low cost, but we do want to bring the economics in because we believe if we do this just as a charity, we will never bring the capital discipline into this whole process. So that's just a few examples in terms of what we are doing, but I'd like to more address a little bit more specifically your last part. I do believe Copenhagen is a great hope. And I do agree with the, with the Secretary General's general comment in terms of polluters have to pay. But that equitable arrangement will be a very difficult balance to reach with the different countries when one is polluting 20 times the level and one is at one. But really that kind of a central fund, which has a lot, which needs a lot more than 400 million from the Kyoto Protocol, the rough estimates we need are something from 50 to 170 billion dollars a, a year to, to 2020 to really pay for this kind of adaptation which is needed. So the fund needs to be pretty significant. So we need to find out how to do that. And the last comment is that also those are just estimates from the Stern report which was done in the UK. But I think we also need to evaluate is adaptation the only answer or there's a multitude of answers between mitigation, adaptation and other elements that need to be balanced while spending the money. Thank you. Co Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan. All the economic and political elite has traveled to Davos to discuss the financial crisis, to discuss what has happened, where we are standing, how we can overcome this crisis. But you would like to lay down quite a different priority of the discussion, and that is to focus on the environment. So you've appealed to these world leaders. You have said that the elite has to be pushed to act. How do you believe that you can get the world leaders to be completely paralyzed by this snake, the financial crisis, but to work on good solutions to be adopted in Copenhagen so that a good replacement of the Kyoto Protocol can be found. There's not much time left. We need to have a new agreement and a good agreement. Thank you for that question. But first of all, let me say that when it comes to the environment, we are all responsible. What we have been stressing is equal but differentiated responsibilities. As the 
uh, our friend from Swiss Re said, so nobody is looking for a free ride. We are all responsible. My country, the U.S., we all have to do what is required. But what do we mean by equal and differentiated responsibilities? I think it has come through on this uh, issue. You have historic and accumulated pollution, which we'll have to find a way of dealing with. And those who were responsible must take responsibility. As we, in, and of course, India is polluting, Brazil, my country, Ghana, at varying degrees. We all have to take responsibility to clean up the pollution we are responsible for. And I'm, when I reuse the word responsibility, I'm talking in terms of duty, duty to clean up what uh, the pollution you are responsible for, not in terms of culpability. I'm not here to lay blame, but to say we do have a responsibility and duty to clean up what we are responsible for. On the issue of uh, the financial crisis, obviously, it's a much wider than the financial crisis. We have serious economic crisis, and the governments and all of us have a responsibility to deal with it. But there are other pressing issues. We have interrelated problems. We have the climate change. We have the question of uh, uh, poverty, energy insecurity. It is extremely difficult to try and set rigid priorities. Yes, the crisis and the financial issue we are dealing with is important and we should deal with it. But how do you tell the billion people who don't have enough to eat today that their problem should wait because we are dealing with something which is more pressing? And I think we have the capacity to try and deal with interrelated issues. And so I'm not trying to say just focus on climate change, but I'm saying climate change cannot wait. The, a billion starving people cannot wait, and we have to find a way of, of dealing with it. And I don't think it's beyond human ingenuity to be able uh, to do that. Uh, and so this is uh, why I'm telling the leaders and others, let's deal with these interrelated issues in a rational uh, manner uh, that will protect our planet. I don't think people will allow governments to go sequentially, and I think I'm sure the governor will agree with, with, with that, uh, because uh, if we were to do that, you're going to have a very big debate as to how you even reorder your priorities. And, uh, and, and I must say that the discussions we've had here, my sense is that the leaders understand we live in a very different world. I was even pleased to hear some of these big businessmen realizing that they cannot get away from some regulation, some supervision, and in fact it may be in their interest to work with governments to help shape the, the kind of regulation and supervision required. And honestly, if they don't do it, it will be imposed on them. So we have interrelated issues we should deal with. It's not a one issue world. Howard Dean. Howard Dean. We've heard it several times today this appeal that all of us can do something, all of us as individuals can do something to change the world, to solve these problems. But let me ask you nonetheless whether with this new president, Barack Obama, who has announced the Green Revolution in politics, don't you think it's important that there is the top down, the not just preaching, but actually practicing what you're preaching to draw one's attention to the importance of these issues and to bring about this cultural change, a change in mentality. Obviously, there are all sorts of different cultures around the world regarding consumption, goods, and pollution. So there is a need for this change. Yes, and I think the United States has a particular burden. Uh, I think everybody is very excited about President Obama. Um, but given the uh, record of the last eight years for the United States, people are going to watch not just what we say, but what we do. Now, the early uh, indications are very good. Uh, in addition to the uh, restrictions on car emissions, 
the stimulus package is pa passing. It's $850 billion to create jobs and to try to uh, stop this economic problems uh, that we have. In that stimulus package is money to build a transmission line, uh, several billion dollars. And that transmission line is going to the, uh, uh, to the lightly populated parts of the Midwest, which are uh, very well suited for wind power. And the purpose of these transmission lines is to transport solar and wind power from the middle of the country in, in deserts and, and, uh, and a deserted farm country, relatively deserted farm country, to places like Chicago and Denver. There's a tangible investment that's going to make it have an immediate return. As soon as, and, and, of course, with this in the stimulus package, we've now paid for it. Um, India is about to embark, uh, is, has become one of the leading countries in the development of an electric car. Tata Motors is, is, has done extraordinary things. Now, India doesn't have so many cars per capita, but they're going to. They have an enormous opportunity not to make the mistakes that we made when we had the petroleum-based uh, motors uh, as we got our cars, and we, have to, we need to convert our fleet. Uh, both in Europe and the United States and other places that have, have heavy number of cars per capita, not just to hybrids, which is an interim step, but to electric cars. Uh, India can start by pushing electric cars because they don't have a big fleet, and, and they're going to have a big fleet, and so is China. I, and I'll conclude by saying, you know, there are lots of views in the human rights commission, uh, human rights community, about whether China should have had the Olympics or not. But one thing I think no one can deny, that the experience that the Chinese people had in Beijing when they closed down and used every other uh, day was a changing moment in Chinese approach to the, uh, to the economy. And so it, it's of interest that we always are going to have these debates about whether, you know, are we rewarding human rights behavior that we shouldn't be rewarding. But on the other side of that, we should never forget that sometimes you need to take a chance and do things that are not pure because the benefits in this case, I think, are going to outweigh the, the, the human rights record, which is a significant problem, but by the experience that so many Chinese people and Chinese uh, 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 bureaucrats and others had when the pollution became the best it was in 20 years in Beijing. So there are many, many different opportunities, but I would say that from the United States' point of view, that opportunity is in changing how the fleet, car fleet runs, which is underway, although it's not so far underway, changing dramatically our transmission pattern so we can bring uh, power from remote areas, which are suitable for wind and solar, particularly to the big cities. And in other countries, we'll have different opportunities, but they're very important opportunities. I've mentioned uh, India and China for two of them. Mr. President, in the forgotten... In the past few years, the... Industrialized countries, including Switzerland, or the, the developing countries, would react to the industrialized countries by saying, well, you can afford a protection of the environment. We have different problems and concerns. But here we have been talking about the right to pollute. How does your country stand within these two extreme views, and what would the position be of the newly industrialized countries? Well, well, first of all, I, I think that no country has the right to pollute, but people have to understand what are the drivers of pollution in the industrialized world versus the developing world. Take, for example, my country. We have a forest. It's 86% 80, intact. That's 86% of the co country is covered by rainforest. But there are significant pressures to use the rainforest to improve people's lifestyle. We have a lot of poor people. We have a lot of indigenous people who live in these forests, and they want a better lifestyle too. Now, the difference, they, they may cut down the trees. They're not doing so in Guyana, but they may do so in Brazil or Indonesia. But can we blame them for doing this? They need to earn more. They want a better life for their families. For they're doing it because it's existence versus someone driving an SUV and, or, or, or an ordinary car in the developed world. So we have to understand what are the drivers in these countries of deforestation. I believe I can deploy my whole forest 
in, in service of um, global climate change, that is to prevent pollution. But I have to create alternative lifestyles for my people so they don't put the forest under pressure. And the forests in the world are very, very important to say, achieving any targets because, as I said before, deforestation contributes 17% of greenhouse gases, almost the same amount of pollution that the U.S. US has. So we have to get some financial flows to create the alternative lifestyle for these people so they don't cut the trees down. And in calculating what it would take to save a ton of carbon or sequester a ton of carbon in Guyana versus a ton of carbon in Europe, it's $4 versus $30. So economically, too, your businesses should want to buy that offset. And I heard um, Mr. Dean speak about his concerns about offset. But I am prepared to allow international supervision on ground inspection and satellite in inspection so you can see if the forest coverage is there. So it's real, it's verifiable. But offsets in the developing world can allow the developing world to contribute to the solution of climate change and provide a financial flow that will allow them to create alternative non-polluting life paths to move on to a low carbon growth path and at the same time offer businesses in the developed world a low cost abatement solution so they can, they can meet their targets at the lowest possible cost. That is why I prefer the cap and trade versus is the, the carbon tax, because the carbon tax, unless all countries agree, that, agree at once, will not work. You would have tremendous leakage from countries moving investments from countries with higher taxes into those with, in, with lower environmental taxes. So these are, there, there is a solution. This is not rocket science. Uh, hundreds and thousands, thousands of pages of technical work has been done on how we can use more money to, to move. If you look at the McKinsey cost curve that was published Monday, it says if you look at the right side of the equation and the left side of the equation, the cost versus the benefit, they say we can achieve all of this at zero cost to the world zero cost. But, but of course in the real world it doesn't work that way. But the, the savings, the benefits from introduction of new technology, moving technology up the learning curve. So, so a lot of the things that will, will mature in 20 years from now, we should move them early up the learning curve, spend more money on these. And you can have a net situation where it will, and, and the whole, it will cost the world very little. I think we have to generate the resources. Let, let me tell you, and if we don't act today, we lose an opportunity. Every year we don't act, we have add five parts per million more to the atmosphere. If, if we don't act today, in the next 10 years, you're going to have 2,000 odd power plants, coal fire power plants, 500 megawatts coal fire power plants built around the world in China and India. Once that, those are built, you have 30 years to deal with the consequences. If we don't assist these countries to, to find a new technology now, you would have an incremental capital expenditure at this stage, but it has long-term benefits. And I'm saying if we can find the money to pay 2.7% of GDP to pay for oil at $60 a barrel, this will only cost 1% of GDP to find a solution to, for all of these problems, including assisting the developing world. So I think we all have to contribute to the solution if we work as a team. And the work has been done, the technical work. It's just an issue of the commitment now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for those words. Just to come back to what you said at the beginning and the social issue, the social question, 
I don't think that uh, we should find it so difficult to understand this social aspect. It's only a little, little less than 200 years ago that our poor had to find subsistence by farming and going into the woods and, and having holding goats. Ladies and gentlemen, I now would like to open the discussion to the floor, and if you would like to participate, and if you have any questions, make any comments, please uh, announce yourself. And would you please wait for a microphone? For your personal leadership in Kenya last year. Um, to avert genocide. And I think you did, as an individual, um, what any individual should do. I lead the laboratory of independent, peace, of independent thinkers around the world. We organized the Pyramid of Peace, uh, the most responsive online community during that crisis, and a uh, hundred peacemakers on the ground, risking their lives, uh, engaging gangs, opening the road uh, from Nairobi to Nakuru so that food could go through. We put in personally about $50,000, which is a small sum, but a lot for us. Uh, we put in two months of time. And I would like um, the corporations to pay that bill, and I would like your help to have them pay that so that we would practice paying our bills. Because uh, we're human beings at our best, we show what humans are, that we don't just have human rights, but we have uh, moral responsibilities. These corporations have all the same rights we do, but they have zero uh, moral responsibility, um, which means basically theologically they're demons. So the demons should be subject to us, and they should uh, compensate us Uh, when we do what they can't do, they have all the resources. They did not apply themselves in this case. And I asked for priority because this was the most gravest uh, situation. And if we got those resources, if it's half a million dollars or five million dollars, and we would share it with all the people like you who show the initiative, you know that these people would, would, would spend it wisely and they would, they would do more of the same. So such a simple way of uh, learning to be family and acknowledging the human beings who are at the core of our world would solve all the global climate problems. I ask for your help. Would you be able to uh, write a letter to these corporations that this be the basis of corporate social responsibility, that they pay backwards to all the people who are helping and until they get all their bills caught up. Maybe we won't need corporations anymore if we can organize ourselves as you did and as we did. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I've noted your comment and I think uh, Uh, I, the, of course, you do have the business society, uh, community in East Africa, in Nairobi. I met many times uh, with them. Uh, I don't know how they will react to your proposal, but do, do send it to me and I'll make sure we, 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 they, we, we engage them. And if, if not in Kenya, then globally, maybe in Switzerland. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Another question here at the front. This microphone. Could you please bring the microphone to the lady? Susanna Mulazantov. And President Jagdeo, in the beginning you said that um, things take really off when ordinary people get involved. And a couple of months ago, when the oil price was at its peak, um, we all got involved. Um, we made new decisions about would we share a car ride, um, should we take the train, um, should we go by bike, so should we perhaps uh, postpone buying new oil for our homes and lower the central heating. And it seems to me that um, this is a point where innovation can kick in because all of a sudden we make new decisions And at the same time, uh, new technology becomes more competitive because solar energy um, is probably on a well, slightly comparable price level. So it seems that a high oil price has a lot of good things to it. And my question to you is um, if a high oil price has been a part of that discussion the last couple of days and what do you think about it related to innovation? I would like to answer that. Well, what you're saying is absolutely correct. We went out to tender in June for hydropower to supply my whole country with electricity, and we got the bids in sometime in November. By that time, the, the financial crisis was at, at, at its height. 
and then the investors had difficulties raising the money because of the credit crunch, but also because the project economics had changed, the oil price of oil had collapsed. So, so yes, it is a good high oil prices, it's good for innovation, but, um, but it has tremendous consequences for small economies. I was using the equivalent of 35% of my GDP to import oil. The United States of America uses 5% of the GDP. So how we can't argue for a price, higher price of oil. What we have to do is to plug that gap by government support. The government has to, to invest heavily and to create the incentives that innovation and the diffusion of innovation become profitable. So that is how I see the alternative because the price, price for oil is set by the market. Kofi Annan? No, uh, the, the issue has come up in many of the uh, meetings that I've been in. And obviously, uh, the high oil prices was an incentive for others to really step up research and look for other alternatives. But I would hope, even though the prices have dropped now, we will continue the research and invest much more in new technology and innovation. And there are those who believe that today, if we were to go green, and really push for green economy, it will have an impact on jobs, on the economy, in the same manner as the Industrial Revolution had on, on, on our economies. And so we should press ahead with innovation. And I think uh, gov uh, the Governor, uh, Dean, also made an important point about using technology to leapfrog and avoid some of the mistakes which have been made by others. But that also means as part of the adaptation technology, we have to make the new technologies also available or at a reasonable cost to the developing countries who can afford it. But I also believe that even governments, through their own policy, can raise money by, from people who use, uh, use energy irresponsibly and perhaps even use the money for additional research. You know, it, it does, we don't have to get the money from high, or the incentive from high oil prices. Governments and corporations should do more in terms of research and innovation because the courageous and the bold businessmen who do that are going to reap the benefits 10, 15 years from now, if not sooner. Any further questions? My name is Andrea Müller. I'm called Andrea Müller. I have a, oh, let's say, rather a question. As far as I know, we have more strict environmental standards than other countries, and our companies sometimes simply move to other countries because the, the regulation is less strict there. Can't we perhaps do something about that? This may be a question for Mr. Singh who is very familiar with international regulations and standards. How, you, how do you see this? Oh, agreement, oh, sorry, the Copenhagen and Road to Copenhagen is exactly looking at that and trying to move in the direction of trying to set some kind of global standards. But right now, I mean, we, I mean, nations are independent. They set their own laws. But then we come together with these multilateral organizations and try to come together and agree on certain things. So you can't just find people or, or take action against them until we really have that protocol in place. Now, I must say something here. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Howard Dean has to leave us before the end of the discussion, so I'll take this opportunity to give him the floor so that he can give, his, give us his uh, concluding thoughts. He has some other commitments. So before you leave us, is there a concluding message that you'd like to give us? He has a question for me, and then I'll let that be the conclusion. Okay. <laughs> also, Fraken. So, is there a question for Mr. Dean at the back of the hall? I have a question which is relevant for Dean and some of the others. We have now a global problem on the climate. We have also a global financial problem. And uh, for the first time, this is really global. Some years ago, there was a proposal having a Tobin tax 
a tax which would tax excessive financial transactions which were not really necessary. Isn't that a fantastic opportunity now to reintroduce the thinking of the Tobin tax and use that for the climate issue? Because we have to correct the financial issue, and we have a solution for the climate <laughs> issue. <laughs> I would prefer to regulate the financial transactions that aren't necessary out of existence rather than doing it by taxing. There's no excuse. There, are, there are multiple ways of getting at things and doing things. Uh, one of them is regulation, another is economic incentive. There's no particular reason we should allow terrible banking practices just so we can make money off them. Um, so I, I would prefer to do regulation, and I, I believe that there will be a very significant opportunity in the West, particularly in Europe, which I expect will lead the way, but followed closely by the Obama administration, to stop the kinds of transactions and horrible abuses that have gone on. I do think we need to focus our revenue raising uh, on the exact problem at hand. And I, I think the President makes a good point about carbon offset. It is true that, and this is actually going on now, that developed countries can make investments in carbon uh, offsets that are much more successful and you get much more for your dollar than a, a developing country. And we need to keep that in mind. But I, and there will be differentials. There will be firms that will move from one place to another to avoid, to avoid environmental regu regulations and taxes. That's part of the way of the life. The question is, can we minimize it as much as possible with multilateral agreements? We'll never stop it uh, entirely unless we have world government. And I think there are many countries that would prefer not to have that. So um, this is not, there's not going to be a perfect solution. And I, I guess in conclusion, what I would say is, and I thank you all very, very much for your in, in, indulgence, and I apologize because I was actually supposed to be someplace else a half an hour ago, so this is more fun. Um, <laughs> let me just conclude by saying there will be a mix. Copenhagen has to succeed. For the first time since Bill Clinton was president, you will see the United States at the table taking this very seriously and trying to contribute in a, in a constructive way. I think you'll see a lot more, not just admitting there's a problem and trying to do something about it. I think we need to sit down with the people who are resistant, but because by reducing our resistance, they will be able to reduce their resistance. And there is no one solution that's good for every country. So this is going to be a mix of solutions. Whatever we will do will not be perfect. We'll have to go back another five years later and revise that. But we have to start now. We have to start now, because if we don't, every day that goes by, the consequences are extraordinarily uh, difficult for the entire world. And I, I do think that uh, we have an interesting confluence of leaders uh, that among all the countries that have got to be on board uh, from authoritarian governments to democracies, which are willing to look at this program in a way, in this problem in a way they were not willing to look at 10 years ago, not just in America, but also uh, other countries as well who have this tremendous argument about don't we have the right to a certain amount of pollution. I think the president said it well. There is no right to pollute. Uh, there may be an, a short-term necessity, but the goal for all of us should be uh, zero pollution of any kind. Uh, we will need your help. Because as politicians and, and, and people in charge of things, we don't want to make tough decisions. You will have to force us, you, the public around the world, not just in this room, will have to force us to make the tough decisions. We know they have to be made. They're very difficult decisions. There are always interest groups that will have to be upset, and that's where the public comes in. So I appreciate you all coming out tonight uh, to put our feet to the fire, and I promise you we'll respond. Thank you. Howard. Our Dean, thank you very much for your words, and uh, we're looking forward to making the American government green and America green. Thank you very much. <laughs> Further questions then here in the middle of the hall? Ein kleinen Moment und das Mikrofon wird bei Ihnen sein. There you go. I'm Christoph Golias, uh, economist from St. Gaul. I have a question to all the people who advise others. How about cleaning up your own 
business. For 10 years now, I haven't owned a car anymore. Sometimes I do take a car. I have taken second class, uh, a second class ticket, train ticket to come to Davos. So wouldn't it perhaps be a good thing to consider that a step back is a step forward? Let's not always talk about new energies and new technology and new dollars. That's the question I have to the panelists. Mr. Gulabchand, I give you the floor. You have the floor, Mr. Gulabchand. Uh, you feel that ball. Uh, it would be nice in an, to be an ideal world where everybody is cycling to work and back and everybody is cooking his meal in solar energy. And uh, there, there are some wonderful scenarios and they must be built so that we can dream of those uh, clean pollution areas, you know. But the sad part is, or also the good part is, that part of the prosperity that we now see is based on consumer spending too. When we talk of consumer spending, we are discussing when, when all the people in the world have sufficient monies to spend, they spend it on a variety of things. And I think that is also what drives our economy, enables us to have the surpluses to find solutions to not just environmental problems, there are medical problems that we have to, we have to solve, medical breakthroughs that we have to do. And we are looking at climate. Climate has one more competition that is coming up and which is far more imminent and far more troublesome. The competition is that we need to have, we are face, going to face a serious water challenge. We are facing a, at this we are looking at by 2020, we are looking at a situation where we have consumed so much water and we use the water so inefficiently. This also is going to contribute to a climate problem, but water is another problem. And there are many such conflicting problems that will keep coming up. For example, let's take the case of Gujarat in, in India where everybody, all the greens of the world came out and wanted to stop that dam from being built, the Narbada Dam, so much so that the World Bank had to pull out of its financing. Now, as a result of that dam and canals, people who were using tube wells to draw water had dropped the water table of the entire area, were electricity short, and today because of the Narbada Canal reaching water everywhere, the water table has gone up, the electricity consumption has come back. So you sometimes get very conflicting things on one side, you don't want a dam, on the other side the dam is what is going to create the good. So these are some situations and I think human beings while they are there are going to spend the money they like, we have to find a way to deal with it. Mr. President? Yeah, um, maybe if I had taken a ship to come to Switzerland, I would probably take two, two months to get here. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes we have to focus on the big issues. There are a few things, if we focus on, that we can deliver huge results in terms of emission saving. The power sector is one. Standards in buildings new technology, etc. We don't need to go back to the Ice Age. Of course, I would advocate a personal level of responsibility, but we don't need to stop the prosperity in the world if we change the way we think about the world. We have to see this as a challenge, but also as an opportunity, that the, the greening of the world, the change in new technology, etc., must become an opportunity. So the spending that is taking place now could have a transformational effect on the world. May, I, a question that was asked earlier was whether, because of the fin financial crisis, whether people should not make these deep commitments on climate change. But they should not prevent us from doing that because, first of all, the standards, the results will only kick in in 2013. That gives us a good four years from now. That's when the Kyoto Protocol comes to an end and the new commitments are going to be implemented. So we have four years to fix the global situation. And in fixing the global situation, this is why it's so hopeful in the U.S. that they are looking 
at um, a transformational way of fixing it that will put the economy on a greener, um, better growth path. That could become very good business for, 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 for capital around the world, but they just compete around a cleaner technology rather than the technology of the past. And the Tobin tax, I'm, I'm in favor of that. This also seems to inspire Kofi Annan. I think you were a bit unfair to Tobin. Mm -hmm. He didn't say we should tax excessive or unnecessary financial transactions. It was a, a simple one cent on financial transactions you know, across the board, mm -hmm. not qualifying it as excessive or unnecessary. Uh, so th that's, uh, but let me say that the question you asked about our friend the bicycle rider <laughs> it, no, it's, it's an important question. Basically, you are challenging us. I'm not, I'm not a bicycle rider. Okay. Train. Train. Oh, yeah. Okay. Train. Train is better, too. Train is fine. In fact, it saves you energy, but doesn't give you so much exercise. <laughs> but let, 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 let me say that basically you are saying if we change our own habits and use energy more efficiently, and try and make our own individual contributions. Collectively, we will make a difference. You know, whether it's using uh, environmental bulb in your kitchen, uh, millions doing it, it, it does help. But of course, we also need to look at the way we do things, how we can do things better, how we can do things with less energy, and how we can be green. And that's where the innovation and the technology comes in. But I take your point that we should all be responsible in our individual behaviors. And when you talk of pollution, I mean, I was at a discussion, I think, last year when <clears throat> we had a forum. Somebody turned to um, Richard Branson, and I said, you are polluting by flying all those planes, and there has to be a charge and a tax. And he said, I'm prepared to pay. But Ivo Debo, who was there, said, you are not the polluter. The polluters are the passengers, and he was right. So, you know, in modifying our own behavior and habits, we can also make contributions. I'd suggest that we take a further question. Here, first row. Thank you. I'm Royce Fernando, and I'm a project leader of a solar mountain crystal. My question is the following. Don't you think it would be appropriate if in all countries there were some kind of education in transparency so that every child would know right from birth what transparency is? So you would have this solar crystal and there'd be some transfer from the richest to the poorer. Those who have generated most profit would contribute most to bridge this gap between the rich and the poor. If this were to be made more transparent, then this would be helpful to all. Thank you for, the frage. Uh, Thank you for that question. Uh, someone would like to pick up this question? Raj Singh? It was, uh a difficult one because I think he was talking about a solar a solar crystal. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your question very clearly. But if I think I th if I think I got it, you were saying maybe the children are educated differently, so they think differently, or did I miss the question? I apologize because I was trying to listen hard. Uh, so solar crystal is uh, an architecture. It's a type of architecture. It's an architectural configuration. Inside this uh, structure, you can show all the difficult topics and make them understandable to everyone. It's also a very attractive platform. Well, the thought behind it is of total transparency. That is why I wanted to hand the question to you. 
because you uh, know so much about figures and statistics and you could contribute to this. One of those houses, because I think it would be a nice one to visit and, and look at, because I am interested in these kinds of things. But again, beyond that, I think, you know, in terms of re-educating children or trying to make them understand transparency better and, and be more knowledgeable about things, See, if I look at myself today, I would say my behavior is significantly changed by the behavior of my children because they're living in this world today. They think very differently already. So a lot of the green activity in my own personal life is driven by my small children, less by me. So maybe not the straightest answer, but uh, I would like to look into this house and this discussion around this solar crystal home. I suggest that we have time for one more question. I was a bit surprised by the subject, global solidarity, a new global solidarity. For me, it's utopian because solidarity doesn't even work on the small scale. You have India where you have billionaires and at the same time people die of hunger every day. And what we've seen in the past few months since we've had the financial crisis, Mr. President Jack Dare was mentioning the figure of 400 million that would be required to build these conservancy dams. And then the United States is spending 800 billion just to help the banks. So what is really the root of this evil? Is it self-confidence? Um, is it self-justification? Is it greed? And now those who have caused the whole crisis are trying to offer solutions. So who is going to offer themselves up and say, I was at fault, it's my fault. So are we going to uncover the faults or are we going to sweep it under the carpet with the same kind of hypocrisy and therefore allow a demonic world to be created with demonic solidarity? Who would like to respond to that question? I'll say something. Secretary <laughs> General, you were the diplomat here. <laughs> Secretary General, yeah. Kofi Annan, I think this is your duty, Mr. Kofi Annan. Uh, uh, there are selfish uh, people in this world. Um, uh, there are people who are selfish. There are selfish people in this world. There are people who care about nobody but themselves. But you also have many others who have reached out to help others and, and uh, their neighbors. We've gone through a very serious crisis. And there's anger, frustration, and fear out there, and I understand that. And I also believe that there's a, a certain loss of confidence and trust in leaders at all levels. And people simply do not understand how governments can find all the money they have found, the trillions to deal with it. Of course, they would tell you. The problems of Wall Street are problems of Main Street, and if you don't have credit in the system, business doesn't work. But the average person who has lost his home, who doesn't have health insurance, who can't pay the child's school fees and believes that the government did nothing to help him or her, suddenly seeing the government produce trillions, feels they've been cheated and that their, their concerns do not matter. Be as it may, I think you have lots of people around the world, I've traveled the world, who are ready to help others, who are ready to uh, team up with their neighbors and other countries to resolve the problems of the world. I mean, for example, let me give you an example. Six years ago, I suggested that we needed to set up a fund to fight HIV AIDS malaria and tuberculosis. Everybody thought I was, I was a dreamer and it will never happen. Since then, we've raised $22 billion to help the sick around the world. It's not much money if you consider the size of the problem, but it, it did happen. And I think some of the issues that we are dealing with, with a bit of courage, will, and determination, and the involvement of everyone, every citizen, we can make a difference. If we follow your line, we'll all throw up our arms and say people are so selfish, they will never make any effort. Let's say uh, hasten the destruction of the planet. We can do that.
Ich denke, das war ein I think that was a very beautiful concluding word. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your contributions. Thank you to you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient attention, for the very good questions, and for the commitment that you have shown by coming here tonight. And I do hope that the gentlemen, the panelists, will will not go out and sit in a, to, in a warm limousine and say self-righteous is wonderful, this discussion, and then go off to a good dinner. I don't think that the gentlemen here are that kind of people. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much.